My name is uh, Marcin Ratai. Everyone knows me as Lidl. I'm working on IPFS in web browsers and user agents. It makes more sense to say those days, IPFS in user agents. I'm leading GUI and web uh, working group, which includes our browser extension, uh, desktop app, uh, web interface, but also we are tackling uh, the behavior on uh, how AP IPFS is exposed on HTTP gateways. So in this talk, I will, it will be like non-native speaker using two fancy English words. Uh, I will go quickly over what pinning service API is, um, what problems it solves and how it fits into a wider ecosystem. During the transition between web two and web three, and for a long, long time, we'll be living in that hybrid uh, reality and I believe pinning services will serve an important role in that transition period. So I said there would be two uh, English words, which will I use to illustrate my case for pinning service API. First one is permanence. Um, and basically it's something that remains unchanged. Once it happens, it remains unchanged forever or for a long time. Um, and how permanence works in IPFS, it works on top of a concept of content addressing. So uh, when you import your data to IPFS, that data is chunked, uh, it's cut into a block uh, or more blocks. That set of blocks is represented as a DAG, with, which is a tree. Uh, and that tree has a root, and that root has a hash, and that hash represents the data in entire tree. So you import your cut picture to IPFS, and you get a specific CID. And every time you import the same file with the same set of import parameters, you will get the same identifier. And in turn, you will get the same address. Uh, data will be addressed by its own hash, and that gives it a, this permanence in IPFS network. You know that this specific cut picture has this specific address, and that's permanent. Uh, no one can change it. No one can spoof it. Um, the second word is persistence, which is prolonged existence of something or in computer science, it's a state that outlives the process that created it. Um, and in IPFS, that process is importing a file to a local data store. You are importing a file to IPFS, you are chunking it and you're finally getting the CID. And the persistence in IPFS is uh, ensured by your node providing the data to the network. And it does it in two ways. One is it announces it uh, on DHT. It says, hey, I got this CID. Those are my addresses. And here I am. And if someone wants the data back, they can connect to your node and then participate in a bit swap exchange. So they connect to you and say, hey, I want those blocks. And you give them. Uh, those blocks. And that's how persistence uh, happens in IPFS network today. Um, so what happens when I close my laptop? Um, that's the question everyone asks when I give a cat picture example, because you got that file in your local store, you imported it, you provided it to the network, and then you shared that CAD or maybe a link to a public gateway to someone. But you quickly close your laptop. Um, and what happens then? Someone asks network for that CID and it may find your provider records in DHT, but your node is no longer available. So it's just sitting there and waiting. And that's why we need pinning services. Um, pinning services, it's like the main purpose for pinning service is to provide data to the network when your node is not around. And I use that example of sharing a cat picture with a friend and uh, closing the laptop as a very simplified example, but 
this applies also to things like continuous integration. You may be building stuff, you may want to persist logs or artifacts, but you're building in an ephemeral Docker container and that container may be running IPFS, it may be having Go IPFS, it may be imported, but it then disappears and you, you are not able to fetch the data that was logged in the CI uh, output. So pinning service API is a vendor agnostic spec for doing just that, for managing remote pins. And I highlight it's vendor agnostic because it's protect, like, like the one of main requirements for creating pinning service was to protect against vendor locking and protect both users and services. It protects users by establishing a generic API that both tools and services implement. And you, are, you can easily switch between services. And at the same time, it abstracts away details of actual storage away. And that way the pinning services themselves are free to uh, switch between providers. They can uh, use Filecoin as a backend or they can use something else. They can pick the most cost-effective way of storing data. They can have introduce a hot cache for the most uh, interesting data that users are interested in. Um, and that aspect of being vendor agnostic is very, very important. Um, and just to illustrate how important it is, uh, you can see that the pinning service API itself in the context is a very narrow and minimal API. It cares only about pinning and it only takes a CID. It does not handle things like data upload or data import to IPFS. Uh, it does not care about user management or any API specific to the backend where actual data is stored. All those APIs which I mentioned can be exposed by the pinning service as on additional endpoints, but this pinning service API is a very small API. It's very focused on taking a CAD and ensuring that data is around. So, the API itself, it's five, effectively five operations. You can list your pin objects, you can filter them by CID that you've pinned, you can uh, assign names to pins and filter by a name, uh, attach a met metadata and filter by a metadata. Um, so you can find pins which are ongoing, pins which are already pinned and provided to the network, or you can find out which pins fail to be pinned because pinning service was not able to find it on the network. Um, there's an endpoint for adding pins uh, where you simply pass a name and the CID. You may pass additional metadata and in response you get uh, pin status. Uh, the same pin status you will get when you hit the get pin object. So you can, in, after you pin a thing, you can get its state and at any point in the future. And there's this replace pin object uh, endpoint, which is pretty important for managing big data sets, which mostly don't change, but they will have updates over time. For example, uh, English Wikipedia, it was uh, 600 gigabytes in 2017, and it's close to one terabyte in 2022. And most of like pictures and videos in, in Wikipedia does not change. Uh, articles may change, but th those media files do not change. So if you want to persist uh, such huge data set, uh, you don't want to like pay for the overlap time. And at the same time, you don't want to unpin the old data set and pin the new data set because in the meantime, the pinning service may garbage collect stuff that's not pinned. And then you will have to wait for it to fetch the data that, that's missing uh, for that div between old and new version and stuff that was garbage collected. So that's why we have replace pin object endpoint. And there's a remote pin object uh, endpoint for, of course, like unpinning stuff. And the API, as I said, is super simple. There are only two objects. One is pin and the second one is pin status. So the pin object 
request in is sent to a pinning service. Uh, the way it works, it has a CID of a data that you want to pin and optional attributes like name, uh, metadata, uh, dictionary and origins. And pinning service takes that request and it immediately responds with pin status. It will return request ID, which is the unique identifier of your pin request that you can use in the future for managing this specific pin that you just created. Uh, you got a status. So the status will tell you is the data, maybe the data was already on the pinning service and it was pinned immediately, or maybe you are pinning a bigger data set, which will take some time for a pinning service to transfer and to pin uh, into the secure storage. So you get this request ID and you can ask pinning service using that request ID uh, at some point in the future, checking if the status changed from like pending or pinning to like finally pinned. Um, and it has the original pin ID. So you get the same pin status object there. It's a very simple API. Something I want to highlight here is that you got the origins here and you got delegates here. And those two fields, it's th those fields are arrays of multi others, which are uh, addresses of IPFS nodes that are known to have data or are participating in a data transfer. So in case of pin object, when you, which you send to a pinning service, that array is a hint, it's an optional hint uh, to a pinning service saying, hey, this CID, which I want to pin is provide, being provided or is available at those addresses, at those nodes. And pinning service uh, may act on that hint and say, oh, that's cool. I'll try to connect to them. And that way, maybe I will be lucky and I will can like immediately start the file transfer and avoid uh, checking DHT for providers for that data. If you are pinning data that's on your local node, then you just put your own addresses there and then pinning service will try to connect to you when, they, when the service receives origins uh, in your original request. However, what happens when you are behind a NAT and you're, you don't have like a, your node is not dialable from the outside of the internet because maybe you, you disabled relays, maybe uh, your network has a strange network topology. Pinning services uh, by definition will always have like a dialable address or should have a dialable IPv4 or v 6 address on the internet. So that's why uh, when you pin and you get this pin status response, Pinning service returns a delegates array and that delegates array will uh, act as a hint for your client saying, hey, this service will be uh, starting pin, uh, uh, pinning operation for your request. Here are a list of nodes which that service delegated for that task. You may want to like proactively ensure that pro the nodes with the data are connected to it. So then, in case you are pinning your cut picture, uh, you are pro proactively connecting to the delegate nodes and then the bit swap can start. And that's very nice optimization, which means if we don't need to rely on DHT, we, we won't. You, we, like the transfer can start immediately, which is a pretty good user experience, but also it's pretty good for uh, uh, private setups. Maybe you have data on your node, but you don't want to announce it on DHT um, for various reasons, mostly performance. If, if it's a, like a huge data set, uh, it's much more, uh, it's much better idea to announce your address in origins. If you are, are not dialable from the public internet, then you take delegates and make your nodes to connect back to the pinning service. So this is a pretty nice optimization that solves the uh, data transfer in a strange network topologies. Um, so the IPFS pinning API spec is in a YAML file, which is in open API format. We picked that on purpose because it's a, sort of like a state of the art way of doing API specification that then can be uh, fed into code generators. Um, and 
it's super easy to generate client and server for any language you want from this YAML file. It's available on, our, on, on GitHub. Uh, the link will be later uh, in this talk. Um, another cool side effect of having uh, open API spec is that we have a human readable um, documentation generated from the YAML spec, which means the spec itself uh, always is in sync with the docs and vice versa. And the specs include much more than just this like example how each endpoint works with, and with some sample uh, responses and descriptions of all, all the fields. It also has a long running uh, theme of having um, pin lifecycle, uh, the information about objects, uh, identifiers, uh, the provider hint scheme, which I spent some time explaining just before it's there as well and the way you can leverage custom metadata for um, managing pins from your app um, all that is on the pinning services api spec uh, that you can find under this address so i'll spend the remaining part of this talk on uh, ongoing integration work uh, in this quarter. Um, probably the most important part will be native support in Go IPFS. That will be landing in Go IPFS 0.8 uh, in this quarter. Uh, historically, we had local pinning. Uh, that was a command IPFS pin, which enabled you to persist any CID around. So IPFS node will uh, garbage collect stuff if you enable garbage collection and it would uh, remove stuff that's not pinned. And thanks to this API, you are able to persist it uh, saying, hey, I want to keep this IP CID around. Unfortunately, there are no support for um, names. So you had to manage pin and name or the meaning behind pins uh, manually. Uh, that's why now when we introduce remote pinning, you will be able to pin, um, you will be able to pin data to a remote service. Um, you, it will be of course opt, opt in, but you will be able to configure pins in um, no, your nodes config that config may have multiple pinning services defined. And by using IPFS pin remote namespace of commands, you will be able to pin a specific CID to a remote service. And uh, something which I just kind of started uh, mentioning before uh, is that if we introduce this remote pinning uh, API, we may be able to re revamp uh, the local uh, pinning so we plan to uh, revamp local pins to also support things like named pins. Uh, and those API should be looking fairly similar. So uh, should be fairly intuitive for people to pin locally, pin remotely, and then kind of like manage pins across uh, different, uh, different uh, pinning services. Um, and when that lands, we will have uh, built-in support for pinning in IPFS web UI and IPFS desktop. Um, this is just a mock-up, uh, but you will be able to go to the settings and add and configure multiple pinning services. Uh, just add endpoint, uh, add the API key, uh, and you are set to go. And then when you go to files, you will see the pin status. Is it pinned remotely? Uh, for every, like each file and directory. And then if you click on that, you will be able to switch between uh, pinning services and maybe migrate your files from one service to another. You will be able also to have multiple access tokens for each pinning service. Uh, let's say you are using Pinata and you will be able to have like multiple accounts on Pinata. 
uh, one for like personal stuff, one for work, and you will be able to transfer pins between those accounts. Um, and that should be pretty nice user experience for uh, things like managing your pins, but also uh, migrating between uh, different providers, which is a part of the, our uh, no vendor lock-in uh, theme. Um, and that will be landing soon. So uh, we want people to keep using your current providers, which exist, or people should be able to opt into uh, new providers that will appear at some time in the future. So you should be able to easily migrate between different providers using built-in tools. And we are working with existing pinning uh, services to add support for this API. So hopefully ecosystem will be able to leverage that pretty soon. And of course, it's a small API. <laughs> I, I, I could probably describe it in 10 minutes, but I believe this small API uh, is a, has a big ecosystem effect uh, and it will improve the way we persist uh, available data sets on the IPFS network. However, the, the valuable part here is valuable for humanity, yes, of course. And I think those data sets will leave, will be fine. The problem is, valuable for you as a person or as a company when you're no one cares about your cat picture really <laughs> or maybe you no one cares about your customer data which is encrypted and it's just like a, an opaque blob um, it's valuable to you and how do you persist the, those data sets on the ipfs network uh, i think this will unlock uh, possibilities where people persist data on ipfs network even when they don't care about decentralization or don't have time on bandwidth to learn about IPFS, things like Filecoin, um, they may be using a pinning service which is using Filecoin on the backend and not really knowing that uh, the pinning service will act as a proxy that is black boxing on the, all the complexity related to the data storage. And that's kind of like a, a way for us to bridge the gap between Web 2 and Web 3. Uh, people will, it will be, yeah, it's super trivial. It's simple HTTP API that you can use in your CI CD setups. There's no vendor locked in. Um, I, I believe it will be pretty interesting way to uh, make IPFS and in turn Filecoin uh, to the masses in a very approachable way. Um, so I believe uh, I'm close to my time window. So that's in on my end. Uh, thank you so much. If you are interested in more details, I probably glossed over, over a, a bunch of in, important stuff. There's a GitHub repo when we not only have a spec, we got links to documentation. There's a section on uh, already existing integrations, things like uh, Go, pinning service, uh, HTTP client. Uh, there is a test server in Ruby on Rails. Uh, we are working on uh, bringing this integration to Go IPFS and uh, like JS HTTP clients. So if you want to follow all that discussion, here's the repo, uh, join us there. If you're interested in the way we created this uh, API, there's a, a bunch of historical uh, discussions on the issues tab, which I find also interesting because a, bun uh, a bunch of existing pinning services uh, participated in shaping this API. So it's a small API, but it's small on purpose because we wanted to cover, make it a generic enough so like everyone is happy with it. Uh, and uh, I believe that's it. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, but probably out of band. Uh, feel free to ask them uh, on Slack or on Matrix, on IRC, anywhere you see me.